Good morning, everyone. My name is Alex Holtz. I'm a partner at KPMG and head of the telecoms practice. Um, firstly, I'd like to welcome you all and thank you very much for joining us for the KPMG Telecoms Best Practice webinar. Um, I'm going to say a few words before I hand over to my colleague, Tim. Um, and first, first thing I'd like to do is, is welcome Tim, um, who is from a business that we have recently acquired uh, called Numwood, which I'm sure many of you know. Um, we are absolutely delighted to have acquired Numwood. So, Tim, a huge welcome uh, to the KPMG organization. Uh, we have followed you guys for many years, um, as I'm sure many of uh, those who have dialed in today have. Um, and we're delighted to be able to combine our capability and host our first sector insight on telecoms. Um, telecoms is an area that I've been around for many years, and changes and improvements in customer experience have been talked about for as long as I can remember, both in industry and in my role in advisory. Um, it's a difficult thing to do, and what is often asked for is hard data, facts, and insights on what customers are really looking for from their telecoms providers. So what we're looking to do over the next 40 to 55 minutes is run you through uh, with some decent content that will take you through some of those interesting facts and insights. Um, there is a, uh, we would like to make this as interactive as possible, um, so please do submit your questions. Uh, you can find that um, on the portal on the page you're looking at at the moment. So uh, all questions, very welcome. Um, we'll be taking a break in about 20 minutes or so to answer any questions that have already come through, and then we'll finish off with the content uh, that we've got lined up. Uh, so without anything else, I would like to hand over to Tim, um, and we will talk to you all a bit later on. Thank you very much, Alex, and good morning, everyone. My name is Tim Knight. I'm a director at KPMG Numwood, and I guess I focus on two parts of the business. The first is putting in place customer transformation programs, but the second, I think, most pertinent to our discussion around telecoms best practice today is understanding what great looks like from a customer experience point of view. What does good look like? How do we go about building it from a customer point of view? And how do we best need to manage and lead our businesses to put that in place? So I'm going to be talking today about the work of the KPMG Nunwood Excellence Center. I'm going to be talking about insights from within the telecommunications sector, but critically for telecommunications, putting out a challenge to look to best practices outside of the sector, as well as best practices within. So in terms of the agenda for today, I'd like to start by talking a little bit about the work behind the Customer Experience Excellence Center and talk about the way that gives us a unique and powerful framework for understanding and then applying customer experience best practice. I'd like to move on most personally to talk about the current state of the telco sector. Who are the winners and losers, but most critically, how does telecommunications compare to other sectors? And indeed, what kind of areas at a strategic level do we need to be most thoughtful about? What do we need to focus on to best engender a change? And indeed, what kind of commercial rewards are associated with that change? So throughout this, when we talk about customer experience, we talk about customer experience as a long-term value-building strategy that delivers value to the customer and value to colleagues within the business, but also uh, ultimately commercial value, shareholder value. And indeed, that's a critical point to bring out as we look at best practices from other sectors. We'll pause at that point to take some questions, as Alex says, so please do take the opportunity through the WorkCast Hub to post those questions. We'll be picking those up as we go along. We'll have an opportunity after the end of the second question section to cover up a few of those. And indeed, if there's more time at the end, we'll take further questions afterwards. Uh, third section will focus on looking at leaders elsewhere, so we're going to look outside of telecommunications at that stage and look at some specific examples of organizations that are tackling the kind of challenges that telcos currently face. And then finally, let's look at the steps needed to transform. How do we go about getting there? What is a reasonable and timed plan to transform an organization which may be facing significant customer experience challenges into an organization which is a customer champion? So to start, everyone, if I could please, to talk a little bit about the Customer Experience Excellence Center. This is a part of the KPMG Numwood organization, which has been in play for over six years now. And I guess our most fundamental question has been, how do we go about defining the nature of customer experience best practice? How do we go about then understanding how that can be applied to other organizations? And how do we ultimately go about professionalizing and commercializing customer experience? So what kind of opportunities are there 
for telecoms leaders and indeed leaders from other sectors to understand the fiscal benefit, the economic benefit that an outstanding result can deliver. So, at its heart, the Customer Experience Excellence Centre is founded on an ongoing program of research. We've been, for over six years now, conducting research across multiple markets. We've been speaking to customers. We've been interviewing business leaders. We've been looking at organisational maturity. And we've been asking ourselves, what is it that defines the kind of organisation that succeeds? And what kind of challenges do various different sectors and various different businesses face? So sat behind this is a very substantial database. There's somewhere in the region of 1.1 million customer evaluations in that database. And that gives us an opportunity to look in detail at 927 different cross-sector brands. So we have the ability to look at any one of those brands and ask how is it performing currently, but critically, what is defining its performance? And ultimately, what we're interested in here are two ends. The first is which kind of organizations continuously succeed? So who is absolutely standout and how have they got about sustaining that? But I think critically, and perhaps most importantly for the telecommunications sector, we're interested in what organizations do to accelerate pace of change. So we're not fundamentally interested today in playing back the best practices of, a, say, a John Lewis, but perhaps more interested in saying if you have got an organization which has been ranking 150th, 200th, or even 250th, in the league tables, what can you do within 18 months to turn that organization into a position significantly improved, and what can you do within maybe two to four years to move it into the top 100 and ultimately into the upper echelons of customer experience performance? So accelerating pace of transformation is a key theme for today. What the Excellence Center also allows KPMG to do is to directly apply these best practices to specific client problems. So we're fundamentally interested in, yes, understanding what best practice is, but how can that be accurately and quickly applied to a customer problem in order to achieve a better result for any given organization? So when we're working in the field of customer experience strategy and we're working with leaders in organizations that are keen to transform, the question which is often posed is, what kind of culture do I need to put in place in order to enable that transformation? What kind of organizations have already managed to transform their culture accordingly? What can we learn from them? And what does that mean for my own operating model? What does that mean for the way in which I manage my own leadership team? And how can we go about applying some of those best practices to high-level management challenges? From a point of view of experience design and journey mapping, again, the Excellence Center gives us a unique view and allows us to say, what is it that organizations elsewhere in the world are doing, which could be pertinent to a specific journey or a specific series of omni-channel interactions that I'm redesigning, and how can we almost use the laboratory of global customer experience best practice to very quickly, in a rapid and agile way, apply very specific innovations to specific customer journey challenges. Equally, what the Excellence Center allows us to do from a point of view of creating a link between customer experience best practice and commercial best practice is to understand the kind of things that organizations need to focus on in order to best drive commercial performance. So from a strategic investment point of view, the Excellence Center allows us to link specific journeys and specific outcomes to commercial results. And then finally, before we move on, it's equally a way for us to augment Net Promoter Score and Customer Experience Measurement Programs in such a way that we're not simply describing a single organization's voice, but rather drawing on the best practices of others to tackle common problems. And through that, to really put our clients in a position whereby they're able to accelerate their pace of customer experience change. So the Excellence Center sits at the heart of this work. Um, what the Excellence Center tells us that is that a customer experience at its heart is fundamentally an emotional connection with a specific customer at a specific moment in time. And if we're going to achieve best practice, if we're going to achieve the success that we're looking for, we need to be absolutely precise as to what that emotional connection looks like. We need to be in a position to diagnose not just what we need to deliver emotionally to the customer, but how we go about building it through systems and behaviors and indeed through digital. And indeed, we need to be able to articulate, if we get everything right, what's the economic impact of this emotional connection. So this is not customer experience simply as an emotional play, but customer experience as a way of understanding emotions and therefore driving business results. So throughout our work and for the last four years of the six years we've operated the Excellence Center, we've talked heavily about the six pillars. 
as a customer experience framework. And to all intents and purposes, the six pillars are the DNA of a successful customer experience. So we've taken the opportunity to look at over 400,000 customer experience reviews across sectors, across continents, and we've taken the opportunity to run analysis that allows us to see what are the common themes coming through each and every time. What do customers use to describe an outstanding experience? And indeed, what kind of things are absent or indeed criticized in a poor experience? And time and time again, the six pillars come through clearly. So the DNA of customer experience best practice and is indeed a way of describing in precise detail what we need to achieve. So in brief, the six pillars. First of all, personalization. The ability to create an experience which is personal to the individual. The ability, potentially through digital, to make it feel as though the customer is receiving something which is unique to them, but equally through face-to-face -face and indeed telephony channels, an opportunity to use verbal cues and psychological cues to really engage the customer in feeling as though it isn't a cookie-cutter experience. It is very much tailored to their unique circumstances. Secondly, integrity. Integrity is the definition of behaviors the organization puts in place in order to create trust between it and its customers. What is incredibly important about integrity within telecommunications and other sectors is that it effectively subsumes many of the other pillars. So rather than focusing simply on areas like personalization, empathy, a lot of organizations have come to realize that they can only be successful in those areas if their baseline integrity is strong. I think in that regard, some very strong lessons that we can draw from the way in which financial institutions over the last six years have built integrity or regained trust with their customers. Thirdly, expectations, the ability to accurately set and manage expectations, not just through a specific experience, not just through a specific interaction, but through the relationship as a whole. And this is an area where we see, particularly in telecommunications, the interplay between marketing and operations has been absolutely key. So the brand promise and the way in which that is communicated to customers needs to be matched by the operational reality. And indeed, in many instances, it is better to weaken the bad brand promise and close the gap between operational reality than find that we're essentially over-promising and dampening expectations. Fourthly, resolution. Resolution is a characteristic of all great organizations that recognize that fundamentally things will go wrong. You know, great businesses make mistakes, but the hallmark of an outstanding customer business is that they have a resolution culture seeded through everything they do. So this isn't a complaints procedure, this isn't a customer service function, but this is the ability through every single interaction to understand when things might go wrong and to empower colleagues or put in place the right systems to allow those experiences to be resolved. Fifthly, time and effort. The ability to minimize the amount of effort the customer puts in, but as much as anything else, the ability to recognize that the customer expects a return for the time they put in. So it feels that each interaction is a fair and equal interaction. The time they put in means that they get value out. And not necessarily time and effort simply from the point of view of making things happen more quickly or indeed reducing absolute time. So for instance, contact center metrics like call waiting and the overall dwell time, but ultimately the way in which we manage that customer through the process and how we communicate throughout. And sixthly and finally, empathy, a very, very difficult pillar for many organizations to pursue, the ability for colleagues and indeed for systems to mimic colleagues' behavior um, to essentially understand the customer's unique circumstances and put themselves in that customer's shoes. And again, a bit like personalization, really at the very apex of the six pillars, one of the areas that organizations often aspire to put in place, but find it very difficult to do so before other pillars have first been implemented. So the six pillars creates a framework for us to look at not just the telecommunications sector, but indeed best practices from other sectors. Crucially, as you would expect, the six pillars can be linked very clearly to key customer outcomes. So we do a lot of work to look at the extent to which they're driving advocacy, whether you're looking at that through net promoter score or indeed other metrics. And equally, the six pillars have very strong correlations to driving loyalty. What we tend to see is that across the board, personalization comes through most strongly. So the yellow segment on these diagrams here in driving both advocacy and loyalty. But equally, you can see the important role of integrity and time and effort in pushing things forward overall. 
However, what is, I think, perhaps most important in understanding the six pillars is not the extent to which they drive the slightly abstract measures of MPS or indeed loyalty, but indeed the extent to which they drive financial value. So, what we have looked at this year, and this is a piece of analysis we've recently run in both the US and the UK, this particular piece looks at the UK markets, is the link between customer experience, best practice, and indeed financial performance. So this particular piece of analysis looks at the UK top 100 brands. It looks at the way in which they've performed over the last five years, and it looks at the FTSE 100. And the finding is pretty startling and very strong. What it shows us is that the top 100 customer brands have achieved double the rate of revenue growth of the FTSE 100, and indeed, those organizations which have managed to occupy the absolute apex of the pyramid, those top 10 brands who are the UK customer champions, have on average added £43 million more to sales every year compared to the other excellent brands in positions 11 to 100. So again, a very clear message coming through for customer experience professionals and business leaders that by mastering the six pillars and achieving customer experience success, we're not only in a position to understand how to create a better relationship with our customers, but there are very real and tangible financial results for doing so. So with this framework in mind, let's move on at this stage to understand the way in which the telecommunications sector has performed. I think the first point to bring out is, as is probably no surprise to many of us who work within telecommunications and tackle customer data and indeed customer challenges on a daily basis, telecommunications struggles to perform as strongly as other sectors within the UK. So if we look at this most recent data from 2015, we see the telco sector clearly occupying ninth place. So we are currently just ahead of utilities and indeed the public sector in that regard, sitting behind uh, logistics and indeed all other sectors. Perhaps what is most worrying or most challenging for telecommunications is that the pace of change, the pace of transformation has not perhaps matched other organisations within the UK. So over the course of the last year, from when we conducted work in 2014 through to this most recent analysis in 2015, we have seen every single major telco brand decline within the customer experience rankings. And overall, the sector has slipped by 1%. So we're seeing at this moment in time that despite a will to transform, transformation within the telecommunications sector is not present and not being felt by customers. So let's move on to look at some of the reasons why. And in our conversations with executives and leaders within the sector, a number of points are frequently made, and we see these resonating to a degree in our own data. The first is, and without going into absolute specifics of customer journeys, the first is the challenge of transiting from perhaps what could be characterized as an engineering and indeed acquisition-led culture to a culture which is genuinely customer-centric. So we know, for instance, that major telcos, not just in the UK, but indeed in Australia and North America, are continuously grappling with this challenge. How do we go about achieving customer centricity, not as a set of principles, not as a set of investments, but as a cultural theme which encapsulates a way in which everyone across the business works? A huge challenge, and indeed one which other sectors are equally grappling with at this moment in time. Customers tell us they find the journey to be incredibly high effort. So if we look at the 18 to 24 month you know, engaging and re-engaging journey that many of our businesses struggle with, customers find that to be incredibly laborious. They find it to be high intensity. And whilst there are emotional high points, which we'll all be very familiar with to that customer journey, equally, customers report that the amount of time and effort they need to put in to managing their relationship and managing that continual re-engaging with uh, telco, uh, that amount of time and effort to be disproportionate to the value they feel they're getting out. So taking time and effort out of customer journeys is given as a critical reason. And equally, when we talk to colleagues across the sector, um, a number of points are made around the fundamental complexity of the product, um, often talking about the extent to which current quad play offers need to be rolled out and depersonalized 
customers, and indeed future product complexity as we see the explosion in data consumption, the explosion in potential customer personalization, and indeed horizon technologies such as the Internet of Things add into future complexity. And this is a reason which is often cited by telco businesses as almost an impairment to the way in which customer experience success can be achieved. And what we see that there is almost certainly an element of truth within that, what we almost universally observe is that the complexity and the challenge within the telecommunications sector is perhaps in many instances no greater than the complexity and challenge inherent in other sectors. So if you're running an airline and you have the operational complexity of moving teams around the world and moving sophisticated aircraft and equipment around the world, if you're running a complex financial institution dealing in investments and derivatives and such like, again, similar issues of complexity coming through. And I think one of the main impairments for any given sector or any given organization can face is the perception that there is a glass ceiling to customer success. So again, this glass ceiling syndrome is something we see coming through quite frequently within telecommunications and indeed in financial services, where the organization has allowed itself to believe that due to the complexity of the challenges they are facing, there is an upper limit to the degree of customer excellence that can be achieved. And whilst we'd be the first to admit that these challenges are real and indeed need serious investment and serious leadership to attend to, we see time and time again examples from around the world, from around different sectors and indeed different businesses of organizations that have effectively tackled the glass ceiling. And perhaps to pull out three very clear examples from the Excellence Center work. So first of all, USAA, an organization that many of us may be familiar with. USAA, for those who have not encountered it, is an affinity insurer within the United States. It's a military affinity which provides services to a variety of different customers in some way associated or with families associated with the US military. But it is fundamentally a financial services provider and it also also happens to be the world's best customer experience brand and indeed has been for the last three years. So USAA is about 10% better than the average of the UK top 10, just to give you some indication of the weight that customers place and the value they get from their relationship with USAA. And it's effectively broken through the glass ceiling that many organizations within financial services and insurance specifically believe they face. Another financial organization, Santander from the UK, over the last four years has effectively transformed its operation, has effectively transformed the way in which customers feel about their business of Santander, and has done so against the backdrop of huge economic and indeed social turbulence when you look at the degree of mistrust that has been placed within many banks in the UK. We've seen Santander effectively transform over that period from being very much outside of the top 100 to now occupying 53rd place in 2015. So a real indication of how an organization can transform. And again, like USAA, the leadership of that has sat at the top. The leadership has sat at C-suite. And a real belief that it's possible to punch through the glass ceiling and indeed achieve customer excellence in difficult circumstances. And then finally, just to dwell on um, one further example, utilities within the UK is often compared to telcos in terms of the quality of the experience by customers, often very clear comparisons drawn on many of the themes. Uh, Florida Power and Light um, is the world's best utility. It occupies a strong ranking within the United States and, again, has been able to transform its operation against a backdrop of two very, very difficult factors. The first is long-term issues around trust. Um, you know, utilities, like utilities in the UK, have faced huge trust and integrity issues through the way in which cultures have been managed and products have been sold and delivered. Uh, Florida Power and Light also happens to operate in a hurricane zone. So the kind of challenge that it faces in terms of maintaining power and electricity to the residents of Florida when you can quite easily at points of the year have a hurricane sweep in and knock out the network has been huge. But effectively has transformed its organization. So I think the message for telcos is very clear. Yes, we are lagging. Yes, there is complexity, both from a point of view of product and operation, but indeed cultural. But let us not let ourselves believe that there is a glass ceiling that prevents us from achieving success. 
So let's look at the degree of a challenge, first of all. So we have here in front of us an analysis of the telecom sector average compared to the UK top 10 average. And now our golden rule for the excellent centre, and something which I think many of you will be familiar with, is that we only ever talk about brands within the top 100. Um, within the top 100 in the UK currently, we have GIFGAF and Tesco Mobile, so both performing strongly. But from a point of view of the sector as a whole, it's useful to have, perhaps look at an average and compare it to the best brands in the UK. And what we see is, I think, quite striking, but not unexpected given the observations we've made around performance versus other sectors, which say telcos lags behind on each of the six pillars. So from personalization through to empathy, we have a job to do if we're going to secure customer experience best practice, and indeed a job to do if we're going to succeed in delivering the kind of financial and economic promise that customer experience transformation will succeed in delivering. So, where do we start? Whereabout should we, as a telecommunications organization, think about investing, first of all? I think part of that answer is solved by looking at the logical order through which we need to put the six pillars in play, which is a bit like Maslow's hierarchy of needs in many ways, which is to say that if we're going to drive outstanding customer experience performance, we need to be in a position to understand which pillars subsume others. And again, this is something that we see a lot of organizations grasping with but perhaps failing to implement, which is to say they focus heavily on creating very personal, very empathetic experiences in certain channels, or they may have certain very sophisticated and powerful digital offerings, but some of the more basic emotional needs, integrity and resolution and expectations, are perhaps not fully met. So what we see is that within telecommunications, like many sectors, there is a logical order through which these pillars should be implemented. And the question for any telco, and indeed we'd be happy to speak to any customer leaders or indeed business leaders within telecommunications about their specific data and their specific scores, but the general challenge for telco is to first of all focus on integrity and resolution and expectations, which will drive us up the MPS scale, will drive us up the customer experience scale, before focusing on personalization and empathy. So understand how we can build trust and understand how we can see problem solving and resolution throughout the organization before we start to focus on absolutely personalizing the experience and creating great empathetic connection. That's not to say we can't push on multiple dimensions at once, but let's focus on where we're going to get the most foundational value first and ensure that we're not driving cost and driving unnecessary expenditure by putting in place initiatives that aren't going to deliver the kind of experience return we're looking for. There's also a point about understanding where certain emotions need to come through most clearly. So within the overall relationship with a telecommunications provider, there are a variety of different customer journeys that can be undertaken. And I'm not suggesting at this point we're looking at an exhaustive list on screen at the moment, but what we see very clearly from the excellent center work and analysis is that for certain customer journeys, certain pillars need to come through more clearly than others. So if you dwell on the initial point around integrity, integrity needs to come through very clearly in the joining experience. It's a critical time for any telecommunications provider. Now the challenge should be to what extent are the ways in which we're communicating, messaging, language, the way in which colleagues look towards creating trust building events, to what degree are they seeded within the joining journey, and to what degree are we maximizing our opportunity to establish integrity in those early stages of the life cycle. Um, equally, if we just pull out another, time and effort is clearly key. We've already pulled that one out as one to focus upon. Um, and that tends to come through where that one of the more complex experiences occurs. So something around insurance or indeed repairs or indeed delivery. Time and effort is where customers are really asking us to drive out superfluous parts of the process and indeed drive out bits which may be causing them to expend more time than they feel is perhaps valuable. But critically, what customers are asking us to do throughout those journeys is to make sure we're communicating extremely well and indeed we're keeping them briefed on the way in which that experience is progressing. So again, a second point to draw out is that there is a logical order behind the six pillars and indeed they need to be aligned to certain journeys. Looking perhaps even more analytically at this and to really zero in on these ideas of integrity and time and effort here, 
what we're able to do through the Excellence Centre work is also look at the extent to which different pillars drive advocacy and loyalty. So what you see on screen in front of you at the moment is a matrix which simply maps the pillars against the extent to which they impact on MPS and loyalty in this instance, so from left to right, and indeed the extent to which the sector performs versus the study average. And whilst I think you'll note on perhaps one of the axes that all of these lag behind the study average, we can quite clearly see that integrity, time and effort are not just relatively more important, but indeed are also areas of relative underperformance. So I think one clear message is coming through from this, both from a point of view of a natural order of implementation, where we should seek to put certain emotional connections in place, and indeed where we need to focus. The clear message which is coming through for telcos and average is that focusing on integrity and focusing on time and effort will be the quickest routes to jumpstart in transformation. And what does that mean in detail? We'll look at these at a general level. We'll then pause for some questions and then look at some specific brands. So at a general level, we've talked quite a bit about integrity, but integrity really is about making sure those great first impressions come through clearly and strongly in the first instance. So how do we go about working both into the early parts of a customer journey and indeed what kind of trust building moments are we engineering? How do we go about creating explicit opportunities to manifest our integrity and the manifest the way in which we can be trusted by customers? There's a very clear point about the link between brand and indeed customer experience here. Organizations which are perceived as having great integrity are really perceived as standing for something, standing for something more than profit. And this needs to be something which is seeded not just through marketing, but indeed through the culture of the organization and indeed through the way in which those organizational values are made manifest by people. And again, people are absolutely key here. People who are clearly competent are required to build integrity. But equally, if you look at the psychology of trust and you look at the absolute requirements to trust someone, Customers need to be able to like the people they engage with in order to trust them. And again, our ability to really kind of drive that through the way in which our people are trained to engage with customers is absolutely key. And then finally, and perhaps most fundamentally, keeping our promises and delivering upon them throughout the customer relationship, not just at the start of the life cycle. And if we can move on to the next slide, time and effort um, is, again, a really key area that we've touched on already. But fundamentally based on how do we go about making customers feel as though what they're putting in is equal to what they're getting out. And indeed, they're not having to expend unnecessary time and effort. It's not, again, about the absolute amount of time they spend, but keeping customers engaged throughout that process. So what can we do to make their time investment pleasurable? And what can we do to really be clear to customers at every stage about what the next step is, and indeed how long that step will take to fulfill? And from an experienced design point of view, from a point of view of our capability to build new customer journeys and indeed transform them, we need to be systematically looking at ways we can take out unnecessary steps. And particularly in a complex omni-channel environment, particularly where we now have strong interplays between our contact center operations, our digital assets, our app-based assets, and potentially also retail state in some instances, how do we go about making sure those are not simply mono-channel unnecessary steps, but from an omni-channel point of view, we really understand that full interplay and we're making those links as seamless as possible. So, at this point we have seen that we have clear areas of focus, we've pulled out integrity at time and effort. What we're going to move on to do in a couple of minutes is to look at some organizations from outside of telecommunications who are tackling these problems, but I wonder, Alex, if at this point we have any questions that we might pause for. Yeah, thank you, Tim. Yes, no, we do have a few questions. Um, so why don't we, we split those up? Um, even though you've been talking for 20 minutes, I'm going to throw the first one back at you, um, and then we'll, we'll divvy them up. Um, and one of the, uh, the first questions that come through, we've had a couple along the same theme, um, which is how does the importance of the six pillars change depending upon the type of company or indeed the customer, whether it's a B2B or B2C client? So I think you know, we've got a few questions along this line, but really it's around you know, for, for, the, for the people that are listening in at the moment, how do you think about the six pillars, whether you're in B2C or B2B mode? It's an excellent question. And I think whilst this particular piece of work is based on B2C, we see the six pillars working effectively and meaningfully in a B2B or enterprise environment. What we see, I think, is perhaps quite interesting, but the fundamental importance 
the fundamental way in which you create an emotional connection with a person, be they a consumer or a consumer as a business person, doesn't fundamentally change. So personalization to that business's specific needs continues to be incredibly important. Integrity still subsumes everything. Um, however, the way in which you create these emotional connections in a B2B or enterprise environment is very different. So the extent of your integrity, the way in which you back that up to a consumer and how you communicate it might be very different if you communicate into a financial director or technical controller within an organization. So what we've been doing a lot of work around is understanding not just the pillars, but Within each context, what is the specific behavioral framework that sits behind those pillars? And that fundamentally changes from a B2C to B2B environment. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Tim. Um, another question around the role of uh, product and proposition development. So the question here, um, and uh, I'll take a punt at this one, and then um, you can jump in if you uh, have anything to add. So the question here is, what can uh, the product and proposition development team do to help with the performance of the pillars? Um, and I think that this is a, you know, it's a great question, and, and it's particularly pertinent to the industry at the moment. There's a lot of talk around agile product development. Um, you know, the industry as a whole has struggled to get products out into the market um, in a short time frame. Um, different organizations have different versions of what short is. Uh, I'll tell you, they're all very different to how they see it on the West Coast. Uh, if they're a, they're a startup, which will be thinking days, telcos tend to think in weeks, often months, and uh, sometimes seasons. Um, so um, I think one of the things that would be great to, to look at is, you know, and I think the other thing around the six pillars is coming back to the organizational brands. Um, so in terms of the company with whom you're working for um, and the clients you're trying to serve, at the heart of the product piece is to put the customer at the center of the service or product that you're developing. Um, and what we would hope is the six pillars give you a framework by which you can see that. Um, and I think what we're trying to say here is that in order for telecoms as a sector, so for your organization to move forward, we would say that there would be particular relevance to be played to areas like time and effort, um, like integrity, um, like personalization. Uh, and obviously all six are relevant, as are many other things. But in terms of the things that we're seeing that would shift the dial on NPS, which is a key determinant of market share, um, we would say that by looking at your product, how are you going to make this seamless in terms of interaction and buying it and being served on it? Um, what's your approach to welcoming a customer when they take on a new product and service? Done very well in many other industries, not always done brilliantly in the telecom sector in terms of onboarding. So how from the first moment are you doing that? Um, so that would be my thought. Tim, I don't know if you have anything to add on that. No, I'd, I'd absolutely agree with that, Alex. And I think to run the risk of over-quoting Steve Jobs, who famously said, you have to start with the customer experience and work back to the technology. And I think the fundamental challenge for telecommunications, particularly where engineering cultures are very strong, is that often the flow works the other way. Yeah. And what we have attempted to create with the six pillars is not just a framework for understanding customer experience, but also a framework for managing collaboration between parts of the business. And what we see time and time again, particularly in the States, Alex, as you say, the organizations which are five, six years ahead with omnichannel and really kind of pushing the rate of change in agile development is that everyone from proposition through to marketing, through to IT operations, even HR, sit around the customer table. And that ability to use the six pillars, the unifying vocabulary for all of those functions becomes a real key to unlocking change. Yeah. Um, so we'll do, we'll do one last question now, but please do keep uh, firing them in. Uh, uh, a topical question, um, so what impact do you think the recent cyber security breaches has had on customers? Um, you know, I think fr from my perspective, it's, a, it's a, a great question. It's something that's very hot for the industry right now, and not just for telecoms. Um, I think what we're seeing here is that cyber security and data protection is at the core responsibility for the sector and for individual organizations. This isn't a, a periphery activity. Um, and we'll touch on briefly in terms of the telecom survey we recently did, which talks about data trust uh, and security. But I think it, it is clear that when you highlighted almost ahead of what's happened in the last couple of weeks, something like integrity, which is really defined about being trustworthy and engendering trust, in order for telecoms customers to want to engage fully with us as, a, as organizations and as a sector, they need to trust. Uh, they need that trust in us. And I think that as a sector, we've got to do a very good job of responding to the recent crisis, really, by, by building that trust back up. I absolutely agree, Alex. And I think the reality is that 
cyber security is not a cost associated with mitigating risk, but it is rather an essential investment in the customer experience and therefore an essential investment in securing growth. And we see throughout times of crisis, and we've seen this within certainly the financial sector, that integrity, you know, trustworthiness, grows even more greatly in status. So from this work which was conducted six weeks ago, we're in a position to already articulate the importance of integrity. I think given some of the recent events and some of the noise in the media, what we can almost certainly surmise is that integrity will be even more important. And having a firm and robust and public cybersecurity strategy will be fundamental in ensuring customer-led growth. Yeah. So, well, thank, thanks for that. So, please do keep the questions coming in. We, we're going to go for about another four, 15 minutes or so, um, and uh, the next piece we're just going to walk you through is some examples of best practice. So, uh, Tim, back to you. Fantastic. Thank you, Alex. So we'll move through this at some pace, talk a little bit about a few brands that may be familiar to some of us, maybe less familiar, and indeed then move on to look at the kinds of things that an organization should be doing to best unlock pace of change. I think in terms of focusing in on those two themes of time and effort and indeed integrity, to pull out a very familiar brand, first of all, First Direct, one which in 2014 was actually top of the UK customer experience rankings, has slipped down into second place this year, but has consistently maintained an outstanding level of performance. And what is perhaps most exceptional about First Direct is the fact that it's able to engender record-breaking levels of integrity with its customers, despite never meeting them. So First Direct manages to run that all through a contact center and, indeed, digital channel, and, indeed, through the way in which those channels have been optimized, and specifically through the way in which First Direct has managed to build and manage and propagate and reinforce its culture, it has been absolutely stellar in terms of its performance for integrity for the six years we've been measuring First Direct's performance. I think at its absolute heart here is its ability to really engage with colleagues in the First Direct mission. So despite being part of the HSBC group, First Direct has a very distinctive brand. It has separate premises and it has separate ways of managing its colleagues and indeed separate systems. And has built, spent a lot of time making sure the kind of customer experience principles that it's seeking to put in place for its customers are reflected in the way in which colleagues are managed on the contact centre floor. So First Direct has fundamentally realized that the employee experience precedes the customer experience. And by making sure that culture optimization and the way in which colleagues of all levels are managed is absolutely top of the agenda, First Direct has been successful in building integrity. And that's a message which has been consistently led from the top of the organization. The CEOs of First Direct over the years have consistently believed this and espoused it very publicly. Another organization which we've looked at already but it's perhaps worth dwelling on for a second in a little bit of detail is USAA. So USAA, a military affinity insurer, the best customer experience brand within the Excellence Center's measurement of brands around the world. And I think perhaps the most telling thing about USAA when it comes to integrity is a quote from its CEO who was asked by an analyst as to what its upsell strategy was. You know, to what degree is USAA going to drive additional revenue through more effective upsell? Um, the answer was clear. We don't practice upselling. We practice downselling. We practice downselling to ensure the customer gets exactly what they want. So what USA have done is made a bold call to build integrity by saying what is more important to us is driving long-term value through making sure the customer gets the right product rather than driving short-term economic return by trying to potentially position products which are perhaps too expensive or perhaps beyond that customer's need. It's absolutely critical, and indeed this is something USAA, again, believes at the top. Its CEO and vice presidents are regular commentators on customer experience, and indeed they drive through their technological innovation. So the entirety of their omni-channel operation, from the various different apps it has to its new Siri-like um, digital assistant, which can deal with your kind of banking needs uh, through audio uh, on your device. Every single one of these digital investments has been driven through this need to continuously drive integrity and continually drive the brand principles through the customer experience. 
And a third example, looking slightly further afield to Kiwi Bank, an organisation which clearly started in New Zealand, but has made great guns and expanded out across Australia. And Kiwi Bank is a truly interesting organisation in terms of the way in which it manages its teams. In that it very actively encourages teams to be structured around customer problems as opposed to teams being structured around administrative units. So a lot of what Kiwi Bank has been doing is saying, let's make sure the customer becomes a fulcrum for cooperation across proposition development, risk and compliance and marketing and service um, functions. And let's make sure customer problems therefore dominate the agenda. And it's led to an explosion not just in customer experience results from its branch experience, but indeed also from the extent to which it's able to very quickly and very accurately with almost eerie foresight develop very effective digital apps. So everything from house finding apps through to online banking apps, which have been constructed from the absolute ground out through around the customer's needs. And as a consequence of starting with customer's needs and the customer's issues, it's been very easy for Kiwi Bank, or Kiwi Bank has been very effective in making sure they drive out unnecessary steps and they absolutely optimize time and effort. And then finally, to look at a brand that a few of us may have come across, Hitmonk, um, similar to Kiwi Bank in some regards, but this operates within the travel industry. Um, Hitmonk has been, again, incredibly effective in starting with customer needs and saying, how would we go about presenting travel information, so flights to all intents and purposes, around the customer's needs and the way in which they're actually making a decision about certain flights and certain ways of transport. So rather than simply saying you, on this flight you'll have to um, endure three different changes, you've got to go from Schiphol to Hong Kong and change again at Singapore, for instance, each flight has an agony rating attached to it. You know, customers recognize that flying can be an arduous experience at times, particularly if you've got a multiple number of stops. And uh, Hitmonk wants to portray that in the way in which they talk about their inventory. So rather than starting with the convenient administrative language of the industry, they start with the customer's emotional reaction and have designed their entire digital interface around customer needs in such a way that the steps between the customer's emotional requirement, the application and the outcome have been absolutely streamlined and minimized. So a few telling examples at this stage as to how different organizations tackle this. How would we go about suggesting telco start? So we have looked at telcos occupied as an industry ninth place. The question is not how do we maintain best practice, but how do we unlock rapid transformation? How do we finally take on the customer challenge and break through the glass ceiling? We've talked a lot around clarity of vision. We've talked a lot about the six pillars as a tool for understanding that vision and as a way that different parts of a business can understand the way in which different emotional reactions need to be created. A theme which has come out through all of our examples is that something which needs to be held at C-suite level. So the CEO needs to hold that vision. If you look at America's best brands, again, the CEO is the chief customer officer. They are the individual who talks about their role being to serve customers and to ensure that everyone in the organization is aligned that way. So that vision becomes absolutely key. Understanding where to start is equally absolutely key. So we've talked a lot about making sure we focus on creating the right kinds of customer experience first and not investing overly in certain experiences which may be ahead of the time and indeed fail to take regard of customers' need for integrity and time and effort. And most fundamentally, it comes down to having the right customer experience capability. I think we've touched on lightly, but perhaps to expand on that now as to what the right CX capability looks like. So across all of the organizations that we've looked at over the six years the Excellence Center has been operated, we've also looked within each organization and said, what kind of customer experience investments is that organization making? What kind of way are executive leaders spending budget on fueling customer-driven growth? And what kind of empowerment do customer professionals have within those organizations? And we tend to see six factors come through very clearly as almost the hallmarks of an outstanding customer experience capability. The first is a very clear vision and strategy as we've articulated, but crucially the toolkit to turn that vision and strategy into action. So not simply a vision and set of abstract principles, but a real understanding as to how do you go about driving personalization for this brand, for this customer segment, and this particular customer journey. So that thinking is in place and it guides everything they do consistently. It becomes a toolkit for transformation. 
Equally great organizations make the link between customer and financial, and a core CX capability, certainly for the world's best organizations, is to say that customer experience must become the mature language of finance, as well as the language of MPS and customer excellence. And to do that, we need to conduct the analytics that links customer experience through to the change portfolio, through to cost, and through to growth. So we're no longer in a position whereby there's this artificial divide created by at board level between the CFO and the DB individual who's championing the customer experience, not because there's a fundamental philosophical disagreement, but because that bridging language is not in place. So linking customer experience to cost and growth being absolutely key. Customer culture, we've touched upon a lot. Culture is a brave area for businesses to tackle, and with the support of the CEO, a customer experience function, working in hand with people, colleagues, HR teams, can be fundamental to transforming customer culture and driving that through the organization, not just from a point of view of learning and development, but also behavioral frameworks, competency, and indeed bonus and recognition. Journey design, absolutely key. Great organizations have almost a perpetual cycle of customer journey redesign, and they're in an ability to, in a position to not just exercise that ability on an ad hoc basis, perhaps by bringing consultants in to redesign a given journey because it seems important or fits a business strategy, but have invested very heavily in bringing that capability in-house, continually redesigning journeys, and continually using their strategic toolkit to drive change. Then finally, great organizations have compelling voice of the customer programs, not multiple voice of the customer programs that describe the customer in different ways through different metrics and different channels, but a single guiding framework which not only links the customer through to everyone in the organization, but also helps dictate the kind of operational investments that organization should be using. And increasingly, we're working with clients who are looking towards integrating six pillar principles into their voice of the customer program. So again, they're in a very clear position continually access not just direction from their own business, but also direction from the world's best brands. So Alex, I wonder if I might hand over to you at this stage to talk about the prize if we get all of this right. Yeah, thank you, Tim. Look, we'll do this rapidly. Lunchtime is fast approaching for, for everyone. So, I mean, we just, uh, well, about two weeks ago, we launched uh, our digital insight survey. Um, and what we found there after we interviewed two to 3,000 consumers um, was that there is a massive price here. And I think one of the things that, that I have noticed is that the real commitment from the boards of the largest telcos to go and really transform their customer experience always comes back to, you know, people can see how cost can be taken out, but can you really link an improvement in customer experience to growth? And I think what we're trying to show here is that you absolutely can. Um, the survey uh, you can pull down from our website, and what I've just taken here is, is three insights. So first of all, there's a bunch of money sitting on the table that this industry is not hoovering up. Customers out there are prepared to pay for, for faster and more reliable broadband and mobile connections. Um, they are prepared to pay more. It's as simple as that. And at the moment, they are not. So that money sits there on the table. The second bit is, ironically, for an industry that drives connections, customers are disconnected. Um, they are disconnected. They don't even know We've got 47% of the people we spoke to didn't even know how fast their broadband was. And if you take that into context of the last slide I just showed you, that they want faster and better, um, it just shows you that even just explaining to them, you know, that value proposition, revisiting what your customers are already taking from you, explaining to them that they have a eight meg service, but there's, you know, a, a, a fiber proposition, for example, in fixed, that's available that they can take, simply isn't happening at the moment. The other thing is value. You know, we are, as a nation, a bunch of grumblers about price and always feeling like it's ripped off Britain. But look at the stats here. Um, you know, the cost, the average price of broadband has fallen by 48% over the last eight years. That is not understood and not known by your customers. So they think you're, 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 you're potentially not giving them the value that you are. Um, and, and as we say here, more than 40% thought it had increased. So we think there's a real opportunity to better connect with the customers you've got. And finally, uh, and obviously it was a very pertinent question a bit earlier uh, around the cyber piece. Again, this was taken over the summer. So three in ten are kept up at night worrying that someone might steal their identity. That's pre the last fortnight. We are going to be running this every six months. So, you know, if we ran that right now, I wonder what that number would be. And I think all that does is speak to but all of those three areas. Talk back to the, the time and effort that customers have to have to 
take at the moment in order to engage with their service providers. Um, and in terms of integrity, well, that one says it all. Um, it's really, really at the heart of the engagement. And as most of the organizations, most of you that are dialed in today are looking to do, is to upsell and cross-sell your products and services. That is only going to be made possible if your customers firstly trust you and want to engage with you. Um, and so what I would leave you with on this slide before I hand over to Tim just to wrap up is that there is a massive opportunity that is exciting. So not trying to beat everybody over the head with a sort of drum call of get it fixed and sorted. There is not just about taking costs out, but there is a growth opportunity. Thank you, Alex. So I think in closing, just before we dwell for final questions, to simply say that the Excellence Centre is a resource available to each and every one of you dialed in today. What we've tried to do today is to share some of the key insights from the sector. It has to be said that the insights go considerably deeper than the amount we've been able to cover in an hour. So please do go online, indeed access the Excellence Centre resources. You can download the latest UK report. You can download white papers. You can sign up as a member at no fee to essentially ensure that you're invited to further events, webinars, and indeed access other materials. For those of you who are actively working as customer leaders and indeed executive leaders within the telecommunications sector, we do have data and analysis on your brand. So if you are interested in following up in more detail, we'd be very happy to take this to the next level of depth and look specifically at the way in which your brand performs relative to the six pillars and indeed the specific challenges that you would need to overcome in order to unlock customer transformation. So that stage, um, we're almost on the hour. Do we have time, Alex, for any further questions, or we we effectively we've got have one time? Final, final question, Tim? But you're going to have to be brief in your answer, uh, given we're out of time. But um, it's my organisation is looking to use MPS. Are the six pillars a replacement for this, or should they be used alongside? I mean, 20 seconds. Um, MPS is a great metric for unifying organizations around the customer, but what we tend to find is that in order to move on to the next step of customer maturity, in order to move on to the next level of customer transformation, add in further context to MPS is required. So rather than replacing MPS, what we see the six pillars do is explaining MPS and helping organizations understand what they absolutely need to focus on to most cost-effectively and most profitably drive MPS and customer transformation. I think we are at that stage out of time, everyone. So thank you ever so much indeed for dialing in. I hope it's been useful to you today. Thank you, Alex, and indeed thank you to everyone who's attended.